Well, hello, everybody. It's Memorial Day weekend. Hi, everybody. It's Monica Wahi. It's May 28th, and it's noon in Boston. And I hope everybody is doing well today. Um, and today's uh, live stream is going to be about um, the uh, Master's in Public Health programs. And the reason why I wanted to do this live stream on Master's in Public Health programs is because I... I get a lot of questions about masters in public health programs and people who want to go for their MPH. And what's kind of interesting is, you know, I've always been into data, but I graduated with my MPH in 2003. And at that point, if you were in public health or you were getting your MPH, um, data was seen as like biostatistics. And I'm, okay at biostatistics, but what I'm really good at is informatics and data science, you know, what we now call data science. And so I, I was an epidemiologist with these, this informatics stuff. And I call myself an epi-informatic, epi-informaticist, but there really wasn't a place for me. And um, now like the AMIA, the American Medical Informatics Association, didn't really have a public health um section or anything in the early 2000s, like so much has happened um, in the last 20 years. But the MPH has always been there, like it was already there in the early 2000s, like MPH programs, education programs to lead you to get um, knowledge about um, public health. And so you could go work in um, jobs, in public health jobs. So um, that was always there. So then this data science stuff happened. And now when people talk about getting their MPH, they're not just thinking about, oh, I wanted to go do design studies or I want to, you know, work in a public health department. They're also thinking about data science. And so I wanted to really talk about the difference between like an MPH, a master's in public health, like what it means when you join that program and what you're getting into versus another master's program that's not in a public health area. Like, you could get an MBA or you could go get a computer science degree or, you know, um, if you're into data science, if you're into public health, you probably want to get an MPH, but then is an MPH at one place the same as at the other? So that's what we're going to sort of get into here. Um, and, and I just get a lot of questions about MPHs and I, I steer a lot of people into MPH programs. I steer them, I help them graduate from them. I, tell them not to take them. I tell them to take them. I give them advice. So that's why I thought you'd find this helpful. All right. So now I'm going to turn on the chat overlay. You know, I've been having trouble with the chat, right? Like everybody knows that. So um, if you try to chat and you don't see it on the chat overlay, I'm sorry. You know, um, I don't know uh, what went wrong. Uh, but I think th there's better luck chatting on YouTube than on LinkedIn, although I have seen chats on LinkedIn, so I, I don't know what to say. And uh, if you're if you want to watch this after I, you know, as a recording, it's probably easier to watch it on YouTube because I can put in links and you can oh, navigate around. All right, so now I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share um, my slide presentation, which hopefully I plan to give you a link to when we. Um, uh, after I put the description in. So this is uh, my uh, presentation, how to join an MPH program. So this presentation is going to take me a while because even though I'm going to go over two main things, which is, you know, the, the background of public health education, especially I'm going to focus on the U.S., but um, I'm also going to talk internationally about other countries. Because remember, it's public health, right? So, like, if you enter the military, you're training for probably a government job. Like, maybe someday you'll work as a security guard or something. But if you enter the military, you're probably going to work for the government. And for the longest time, public health education was sort of seen that way. Like, if you if you learn it, you're probably going to work for government public health. Although that has changed, you know, that slowly started to change, you know, because now we need these skills for different things, you know, but in any case, um, it's really important to understand how these programs are developed. These public health education programs are developed with the thinking of we're trying to serve the public's health versus are you going to have 
the skills you need to do these jobs. You know what I mean? Because uh, so that's why the first part of this might be a little bit like philosophical and heady. And you'll be like, really, I need to know all this. You kind of do because uh, it, whether you're in the U.S. and you're from the U.S. or you're outside the U.S., uh, we are known for certain things, public health things, right? We are known for our, our COVID-19 response. We are known for our gun violence. We are known for our racism, like internationally. And so, um, and these things all affect our public health. So if you're shopping for a program, you're thinking, and, and you don't live in the U.S., and you're thinking coming to the U.S. to study or using a U.S. public health um, program, you know, you have to sort of think, well, the U.S. doesn't have very good public health and everybody who's in charge of it has been trained through these programs, you know, what's really going on. And so that's what this is about is what's really going on and how do you as a student, whether you're inside the U.S. or outside the U.S., try to use a U.S. system or some other training system around the world to learn about public health if you want to. And then I'll give you just practical information about how to apply for U.S. schools in public health, U.S. master's programs, which I'm pretty good at helping people do. All right. So first, I'm going to talk about accredited public health schools. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to first talk about the U.S. And in the U.S., um, this is how we accredit our public health schools. OK, we have a thing called the accredited. Uh, Council on Education for Public Health, or CEPH. And when you go and get these slides, you can go to these links where I've explained what the CEPH is and give you the links. Okay. So this council, those of you who are like in nursing or medicine or whatever, you know you have to get your schools accredited too. So you have, like in nursing, there's different accreditation agencies and they all have these rules about how you fill out this packet and what stuff you have to have in your program or whatever. And then they go through this process of crediting the school. Well, in public health in the U.S., it is only the CEPH that does this. There's no choices. You, like it, you're accredited by the CEPH or you're not. OK, so what does the CEPH accredit? Well, they ex they credit two things. They credit schools and programs. And it's a little hard to tell the difference. You don't really need to know the difference. I mean, they need to know the difference. I'll give you two examples, right? Like I put it on the slide. The University of Minnesota School of Public Health is a school uh, that's accredited. And also the University of South Florida College of Public Health is also accredited by the CEPH. So these schools are accredited. Um, you may, I, I just mentioned both of these schools in the same breath, the College of Public Health, the University of South Florida and the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. In fact, you might even think from the name college sounds bigger than school. But I'll tell you, the University of Minnesota School of Public Health has so many faculty, like so many. If you're the kind of person who's looking for somebody who connects with you, you should be going to the University of Minnesota because there's so many faculty there. At the University of South Florida, there's hardly any faculty. It's a tiny college there. So, um, so uh, do, you have to look at each one. So just because it says school doesn't mean it's big, but it does mean it's a school. Now, uh, Tufts uh, University in Boston has a medical school, but they don't have a public health like college or school, like something named like School of Public Health or College of Public Health. So they have a program where they teach the same thing. You can get a master's degree in public health. So that's what the ASPPH is, the Associations of Schools and Programs in Public Health. They're the ones who are currently accredited by the CEPH. And, and so once you get accredited, like once the U University of um, Minnesota's program got accredited, I mean, you can technically get unaccredited, like if you become bad, but I've never seen it happen. I mean, maybe it has happened. I, I didn't do any research. I've never seen the CPH unaccredited school. Like if, if you are watching this or you listening to this and you know I'm wrong, like they've done it, um, a school or a program, please put it in the comments because I'd like to hear the backstory because I, I haven't really seen that. I haven't seen 
the CEPH really make sure that their accredited schools are performing well um, in a heavy handed way. I've just never seen that. Okay. But I have seen that you have to fill out all this paperwork to get your school accredited and uh, or program. And also there's not that many. I mean, when I say there's not that many, maybe there's a hundred at the most um, in the U S at any given time. It, it's not like, you know, if you want to study psychology or something. All right. Okay. So why did I just go into this big deal about accredited schools? Is because even international students should not go to unaccredited public health schools. Now I'm just talking about the U S if you're in the U S and you can find an unaccredited public health school that the CPH did not accredit, don't go there. It's just not good. Okay. If you're, an international student or you're a domestic U.S. student, you want to go study public health internationally because I just heard what I just said on the last slide. And you're like, I want to look at a better school. Please understand that the other countries also kind of do the same thing we do is they make their governments try to make sure their public health training is good. So you're going to want to make sure that whatever school you go to internationally is actually accredited. Now, what happens is often these um, countries feel very weak, right? Like I remember when I visited Egypt, I was meeting some public health doctors and they, they apologized to me. They're like, we're sorry, our public health is so low level and simple compared to you. I mean, this is Egypt and they're apologizing to me and the, from the, um, no, uh, their public health is great, right? Like, I mean, it's as good as it can be, just like ours is as good as it can be, which, and it's not even awesome here, you know? So I don't apologize, you know, like whatever country you're from, you should be proud of whatever public health you're doing. You should just try to, you know, do something better with it. But the problem is a lot of countries will look to the U.S. or to the United Kingdom or to Canada and try to use those accreditation um, tactics to credit their own um, colleges Thankfully, Saudi Arabia does not do that. They have the NCAAA that accredits all of their, their colleges. It's their own country's um, organization, which is great. And, and you kind of need to do that. So the short answer is, if you are seeking a public health college or program not in the U.S., figure out what co that country does to accredit its, its programs and make sure you go to an accredited one. And if you're in the U.S. and trying to pick a, a program, you got to go to one that's accredited by the CEPH, okay? And if you're like, well, Monica, I don't have a lot of money, and here's an unaccredited program, it's cheap. I'll tell you why it's a scam. It's a scam because even these accredited programs, it's hard to find teachers who even know the material, even know how to do um, biostatistics and um, epidemiology correctly. Like for some reason, it's sort of rare information, like being able to teach that. And so if you go to an unaccredited program, you're just not going to learn. And also if you do, if you are like, especially international students, you know, from outside the US, if you're looking for a uh, master in public health degree to work for your government, those governments don't want you getting some crappy degree that, that's unaccredited in whatever country it was in. So you really need to get an accredited one. You know, I haven't seen if anybody's in the chat. Let me go see if anybody's in. Nope, I don't see anybody in the chat. All right, so we'll go back here. Um, if, if you are asking a question and I don't see it, I'll go back later and I'll look on LinkedIn and also on YouTube and see if I can um, figure out. All right, so now I'm going to speak specifically about how you cause an MPH to be accredited in the U.S., and how you do it, if, if you're like, let's say you're an educator and you work at a U.S. university and you're like, hey, I want to uh, create an accredited public health education program like the ASPPH, you know, um, what I will tell you is the general, I've never done this, but the general idea is you have to make sure that the um, program, the two-year program covers these core competencies, which I put on the slide, which I took from their website. Uh, and I'll just read them. They're a little small. And if you go to the, their website, like you can see that there's a drop down that explains each of them. But this is what the core competencies are. They're biostatistics, environmental health sciences, epidemiology, 
health policy and management, social and behavioral sciences, communication and informatics, diversity and culture, leadership, public health biology, professionalism, program planning, and systems thinking. So uh, that's a huge list. And so if you think about it in two years, you know, maybe you have one, two, three, four, um, like semesters, right? Like if you have summer, maybe a few more semesters, but you've got to cover all this. And the accredited program has filled out paperwork to prove that they've got classes and in two years, they'll cover all this. And what that means is in your MPH, you really can't specialize that much because regardless of whether you say, oh, I want to be in maternal child health or infectious disease, you're going to be covering all of these basic things. So you just won't have much of an opportunity to take electives. You know, you kind of can, but not a lot. Like if you want to get your PhD in epidemiology or biostatistics or something, that's where you really learn more, you know, in, in, in the U.S. in, in courses. Um, but this is mostly you're going to be learning content about the top chronic and infectious diseases. And then you're going to be learning the skills like the epidemiology, biostatistics. How do you do health promotion? How do you do interventions? How do you make healthcare policy, public health policy? How do you deal with environmental issues? And they started adding leadership and inclusion. You know, I've been following this for years, last 20 years, um, and, and elevating that a little bit more. All right. So I, I advocate that I, it's going to sound like I'm giving you a mixed message. I advocate for anybody who wants to get an MPH to get an MPH from an accredited U.S. program. It's just not, not any old U, accredited U.S. program. If you can find an accredited U.S. program that is actually good, that's actually a quality program that's worth its money, then you should go to it. But don't look at U.S. accredited programs and say, oh, they're all good. No, no. That's the problem. Is that, remember I said that maybe there'll be 100, oh, there's probably not 100, it's probably closer to 70 or something. You basically have to, you know, in among those, there's only a handful that I would consider are any good, any good at all. Like you pay tuition, you have an MPH experience, and when you're done, you're ready for a job. Okay. Very few. And so, um, and before the pandemic, um, the CEPH has historically discouraged online education and MPHs. But they started getting relaxing that as online education got better, like 2015, 2016. And then after the pandemic, of course, a lot of things. And, and they started even before the pandemic. There were all online programs that were accredited MPHs. But as you all probably know, it's very it's much easier to have crappy education online than than in person. Like if you're in person, you know, you almost can't help learn something from a teacher who's not that good, but somebody, who, you know, online, a teacher's not that good and they don't know the material, you're, you're really not going to learn it. So, um, so even though these programs will be set up for international students and they'll be, um, accredited and, um, they'll be like, uh, you know, like you could take them online and whatever, a lot of these programs, the training was low quality, like a long time ago it was low quality before 2010 and a lot of these people are still teaching in the same programs and, and the training was low quality. So with online, it's worse. And so I guess this is a big picture of saying, um, you've got to be very careful when you shop for an MPH program in the U S there are more bad ones, accredited ones. There are more bad ones than good ones. And so you've just got to be very careful. So I, I put a picture of a person on slide saying, if the programs are accredited, why is the training such low quality? Right? Like, isn't that like the million dollar question? Let me see if anybody's got any questions here on the chat. Um, nope, I don't see any questions. All right, let's see. I'll go back here. So, so why is that, right? So you probably are thinking, um, well, maybe there's a problem with the accreditation system, you know, maybe a problem with these systems. And, and that's it. So this is where it gets a little 
heady, but this applies to public health. So if you want to get your MPH, you probably want to know the history of public health, right? So those of you who study like, um, like medicine, in, you know, modern medicine, the history of modern medicine goes back to the 1800s. And those of you who um, listen to my lectures, like I have a kind of popular lecture on the history of healthcare in the U.S., um, you know that like our hospitals, our first hospitals in the U.S. were in the late 1800s. By contrast, and, and also they were they teaching medical students. They were medical schools like Harvard Medical School and University of Minnesota Medical School. They've been around since then. But by contrast, public health as a discipline really did not get organized until about like the 1970s, like the late 1970s, 1980s. In fact, um, the University of Minnesota, the School of Public Health that's there now was the, I think it was called the Laboratory of Industrial Hygiene or some weird name like that in the 70s. And it was if you're if you're an alumni and you know this better, like you worked it, there, like definitely comment on this. Um, by the time I started working epidemiology at the University of Minnesota, I was already in my late twenties. It was the nineties, but people were talking still about the seventies and how this laboratory of physiological hygiene—that was what it was called—was in the basement of a, a rotting stadium at the University of Minnesota, the stadium was falling apart, which is ironic because it's like public health, right? Like the occupational health right there. But anyway, so there's some old pictures of people in the stadium from the stadium days. They finally like knocked down that stadium. And so by the time I was working in public health at the University of Minnesota, we were in like an office building, you know, a real office building. But that just goes to show you, like, that was the beginning of that program in the early 80s, where it was becoming a school, and they like, didn't even have any offices. And this is like the history of a lot of programs. Like, even, like, I was shocked at the University of South Florida. Their program started in the 80s, too. And um, so if they're starting in the 80s, you know, that, that's a lot different than starting in the 1880s, right? So let's think about it. They were starting these programs in the 80s. They're, they're starting epidemiology. They're starting biostatistics. I mean, people could do it, but you didn't have all these people trained in it and talking about it the way you had in engineering and psychology and everything. Then when I came on the scene as a research secretary in epidemiology at the University of Minnesota in the late 1990s, we were undergoing the evidence-based medicine movement. And that was the whole idea that a lot of the medicine being practiced was not based on evidence from research because, hello, we were just inventing the research method. So there was this idea we had to go back and do over. We had to do a bunch of research about stuff that was already being prescribed, like hormone replacement therapy for WHI, Women's Health Initiative. That was one of the things we had to do evidence-based medicine on. We had to do evidence-based medicine on a lot of our blood pressure lowering um, drugs. Um, and so that's, so, so we were shifting our thoughts and medicine towards outcomes. We were even, I didn't put it on the slide. We were thinking about quality of life. Like how do you measure quality of life? We, we were not saying, oh, we gave out all these drugs. We were saying, oh, we healed these patients. We were moving towards outcomes. But by 2003, the MPH programs were not looking at program outcomes on the basis of quality. Instead, they were looking at program components. So if you were going to say, like in nursing, let's say you have an accredited program, nurses have to take this uh, uh, um, test called the NCLEX. And if the rate of passing that NCLEX goes below a certain level, you lose your accreditation because it's obviously not a quality program. So that's an example of outcomes. But the CEPH was not interested in what is your rate of graduation? What is your rate of dropout? What it, how, how badly are, how do students rate your program? Are they complaining? Are they miserable? You know, are people, is there equity? Are people getting good training? They were not doing outcomes. What they would do is in your paperwork, you had to prove you had certain components, like especially if you remember, HIV became a big problem in the 90s. 
And so a lot of people wanted to study HIV. So they'd say, okay, well, do you have a professor who can teach HIV? They didn't ask, is that professor good at teaching it? Does that professor e treat students equally and with respect? You know, does that professor, uh, are, are they intelligent themselves? Can they mentor? No, it was just do these components. Are they there? Is a the professor there? Is the lab there? Right? And you will, if you join all of these um, organizations, you know, the APHA and all that, if you really get into public health and you watch this stuff, you'll start seeing that they're trying to correct this bias now. You know, I, I mean, maybe they've been trying for the last few years, um, but it has been a big problem because I'll show you why. Years of program component versus program outcome bias has made it so people, the, the CEPH wasn't really looking at outcomes and making sure people coming out of these programs were satisfied and had what they needed and could go and get a job and, you know, were, were you know, good public health uh, citizens. They instead were saying, okay, programs, if you want to train people, you have to have all this stuff. So this caused social injustice among the programs. Programs were rewarded for simply having more resources. So this basically exacerbated, like, let's say that you were in a low resource area and you wanted to a public health program. What if you couldn't hire an HIV person? What if you couldn't hire somebody who can, you know, who's really good at teaching epidemiology? Then what? You know, what what is your solution? And, you know, their resistance to online training until like maybe 2015, I mean, it was pretty recent. Um, like the CEPH of saying, oh, that's low quality or whatever, it just exacerbated the social injustice among programs. I mean, if they had made it so you could have remote learning and it was high quality remote learning, then it wouldn't have, but it really exacerbated it. It also promoted this thing, which has always been a problem in public health, uh, back to Jon Snow, and that's fiefdoms. And I'll explain them on the next slide a little bit more. But what a fiefdom is, is where sort of a group of people like faculty or maybe even their students with them, they amass some power, like maybe they get a lab or something, and then they draw that power away from the other programs and organization stuff. And, and, and then they, through that, people end up getting, like in, in the workplaces, it plays out differently, but in public health colleges or in medical colleges, it ends up with abuse of students and faculty, you know, like abuse of stakeholders, you know. And so because the CEPH was not really tracking the experience of people in the in the programs and ensuring that graduation rates were were high and that people were not getting abused or subject to racism or or just simply like when I was at USF, I don't have my PhD because I was a casualty of one of these programs. I went and we paid money and whatever, but it was awful. It was just truly awful. I, I left that program in 2008. I don't know if it's any better. You know, I, why should it get better? You know, um, but w I remember when I was there, I was, I witnessed all this stuff. I witnessed the fiefdoms. I witnessed, um, like at Harvard, this is a big problem with, uh, in public health with fiefdoms, you know, drawing resources away from other things like in, in, at the, College of Public Health and the University of South Florida, you know, aging is really important. There's an older population in Florida. Well, the people who were studying aging, they were just not getting any money or anything. It, the people who were studying um, things like um, drugs and biotech and stuff, they were getting all the money, you know. And so, obviously, um, you know, promoting, having the CEPH say you need to have all these components to your program to make it look really great and all that just created fiefdoms it, it didn't really they didn't say oh we need stuff about obesity because everybody's obese in the u.s you know what i mean like they didn't they didn't use leadership which is what they're trying to teach i guess but anyway so as i described it this focus on program components it just allowed racism and sexism in public health to perpetuate there was a lack of protection for vulnerable students. I could just go on and on what I saw personally at the University of South Florida and um, what I now, what is reported by my customers who are in these programs. Um, it's just awful. And um, and not every program, like there's some programs, there's, like I said, the University of Minnesota, you'll, you know, it's big and you'll run into problems, 
right? You'll run into fiefdoms, you'll run into this, but it's big enough so that you can find yourself. You'll find somebody, you'll find somebody studying obesity, you'll find somebody studying abuse, you know? And um, that's why I, I, I say like maybe looking for a big program is a good idea, but I'm not sure. I know the University of Minnesota is a big program that you could probably find your place. And then um, remember this has been, had been going on with the CEPH since about, you know, since the nineties really, where they were doing this program component versus program outcome thing. And ultimately our public health failed during COVID-19. So everybody who was trained and working on this problem in the US, I, maybe not everybody, but most of them had an accredited MPH. And so the social injustice, this historical lack of attention to important health issues like gun violence, police brutality, racism, healthcare, like it screwed up our COVID-19 response. Like so many people are not vaccinated in the US. Um, so many people own guns in the US. Uh, Police are killing people and not being held accountable all the time. You know, it's still going on. And it was all because our whole cluster of public health systems just took their eyes off the ball. And now how do we study gun violence? How do we study racism? How, like, do we have any methods? You know, um, I haven't read this book, but it, it, it's I, I wanted to highlight it because fiefdoms is a concept that came out of I think originally Harvard Business Review, but people have written about it. And I uh, like the APHA, if you follow the APHA, you'll, you'll start to see some patterns in who is the leader of that. And so uh, I'm quoting from this book, it's a basic human tendency to want to control one's destiny or turf, or the, the basic human tendency to want to control one's destiny or turf runs counter to discipline in an organization. So think about that. Like if you want to control, let's say you have an office at work. If you're busy controlling your office, this runs counter to just discipline, you know, like filling in your time card properly, you know, all this all the other things that are important. So if the CEO or the manager of a unit lets people act on their own, the company will soon fall into disarray. So if everybody's defending their own office and their cubicle and they're all worried about that, Nobody's focused on the system and how the whole system runs. And that is exactly what uh, focus on program components sort of promoted um, in public health, uh, in public health education. So, um, but they're always saying they'll reform, right? And so let's see here. I don't see any quotes here. They're always saying they'll reform. Um, but the problem has been getting the APHA to even admit some of these things occur, like gun violence. Like there was some legislation that the CDC couldn't say the word gun or something like that. I'm sure I got it wrong. But um, so we, we had gun violence. We have this drug war that resulted in the incarceration of people and the stigmatization, stigmatization of mental health and our opiate crisis. You know, the APHA just really would not talk about these things and use the, and when I say the APHA, they have um, a weekly publication called, or I said weekly, I think it's monthly, called The Nation's Health. They also have this Friday letter they send out. And, you know, the, they would say, oh, well, those publications are not meant for that. But, like, what are they meant for, right? Um, you know, all of these things I listed on the slide have been problems since the 2000s. Like, I grew up in Minnesota, and the reason I don't live there anymore is because of these problems on the slide are worse. Some of them are worse in Minnesota, and, like, racism is really bad there. And police killing people, obviously, George Floyd, like, that's now international. Everybody knows it. And that is why, I mean, the racism is the main reason I was said I, 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 I didn't know where I was going to go, but I knew I couldn't stay in Boston, or I'm sorry, in Minneapolis and have a career like if you look at the as much as i say good things about the school of public health um at the university of minnesota um they the same people who were running it back in 2003 are still running it they're all white a lot of them are men and and this is still going on so um so all this bad news i'm sorry to give it to you is the bottom line is that to get a public health job after you get an mph you want to get an MPH from an accredited program, either accredited by the CEPH here in the U.S. Um, or accredited by whatever country accredits programs like 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 in Canada or the U.K. or Saudi Arabia or whatever. Right. 
okay, so that's to get hired. Like if I if I'm at the government or I'm at Big Pharma and I'm trying to hire you and your MPH comes from like not an accredited college, um, in whatever country it's in, I'm probably not gonna hire you. Okay. But these programs that are accredited, so many of them have such low quality learning experiences associated with them that you don't really learn what you need to to know in order to do um the the uh to do the job once you get it so that's what the problem ends up being so you might be able to get into an mph program in the us that's accredited and get through it um but you won't learn what you need to know and then it becomes hard to get a job because you don't have to talk to talk and you don't have experiences, learning experience. So shopping becomes really important. These programs change fast. If a person is a leader and they're good, and the program's good, and then they change leadership and the program leader's bad, the program becomes bad, okay? So get recent firsthand accounts from graduates or people in the program, okay? When I was at University of South Florida, one day there was a person visiting who was thinking of being in our program. And they put that person alone with some of us students and said, just go talk to them. And when they shut the door and we were alone, we were like, don't join. This place is terrible. It's, the, it's awful. Okay. And I also have encouraged my customers to go do that. And people have done that. They've taken uh, the visiting person aside and said, don't, I regret coming here. Okay. So, at, and, and so if you're on LinkedIn, you see somebody who's in a program, you know, you just write to them and say, hey, I'm really into public health, but I'm worried about joining this program. Are you having a good experience or not? I mean, can you be honest? And they usually will be honest. I mean, there's ways of diplomatically saying this program's not that good. You know, I wouldn't have chosen, I shouldn't have chosen it or whatever. Um, but in any case, if you end up going to a program, even if it's a crappy one, like your school will, or your workplace will only send you to this crappy one or whatever, you still can talk to people in the program and learn about specific professors or classes to go in and which to avoid, you know, because if the program is bad, it's because there's bad leadership, okay? And that's why the University of Minnesota program is pretty good because there's always been this good leadership there since I've been there, you know, studying. Um, in working, you know, I don't, I didn't work for the school of public health, but I, I worked at the University of Minnesota. Well, I guess I worked in the cardiovascular division of the, of, of something. I don't, I don't remember where exactly I worked, but I was working in epidemiology. It was affiliated with the school, you know, and I saw not where I was working was not good leadership, but where that school has good leadership. I mean, it's not the greatest leadership because obviously there's so pro the same problems there, a lot of the same problems there that were there when I was there but it's still good enough so that you can get a good experience. And so, um, and, and I emphasize, do not be picky about what topic you study. Like I remember people coming to the University of South Florida to study HIV and they'd be there and the HIV person left. I mean, who wouldn't leave that place? It was not a very good place, at least at that time, to be a faculty, you know? And so these people were left there with a half done HIV project, right? So it's better, you know, if you, if you're going to do your MPH somewhere, you know, don't, don't care about the topic. I mean, try to steer it. Like when I have my customers, I try to sort of steer it in the generally right direction, but it's easier to just say, Hey, a lot of these places are bad. There's bad leadership. And it's just a matter of pleasing somebody and getting some form signed to actually get your degree. So that's how you should pick your topic. All right, now let's say you've decided that you're gonna apply for um, a US accredited school. Well, what they did was they created the, the ASPPH, remember? The ASPPH is the club of all these accredited programs and the CEPH is the only thing that can accredit them, right? So all together, they grouped together and they created this application platform called SOFAST, which stands for something, right? And this is a lot like if you've ever submitted anything online, like if you write journal articles or I, I'm trying to think of like what you might fill out and submit online, like paperwork or like you're signing up for something, um, that's what SOFAS is. And so you create an account and you, you have to create, I, the last I checked, you create a personal statement and it, it, you just send, it's like you have one application and it goes to all the schools you designate, you know? Um, 
and you might think, oh, that's convenient. It's totally not convenient because you want to make a different personal statement for each of them. You know, like if you're applying and one program's big on maternal child health and the other one's big on, you know, cardiovascular disease, you, you want to tailor it, but I don't think you can. And I'm not sure you can tailor any letters to them or letters of recommendation. So it's it's like I, every time that I help somebody with SOFAS, I'm always making them log in and give me screenshots, uh, you know, and trying to write stuff down and prepare all the stuff for them to submit. Um, it's a big pain. And you probably get in. They're looking for your money. You know, they're basically looking for your money. And they want to make sure that whatever you did before your MPH at least makes you able to do the courses. Uh, when I first applied to get into an MPH program was long before they created SOFAS. And they didn't let me in because I was a fashion designer and I hadn't taken any math courses. So I took a calculus course and then they let me in the next year. I, I don't know what happens to other people. I, ha I haven't actually encountered anybody besides myself who's applied to get into an MPH program and been refused. And that is a bad sign to me. I think like they should be refusing people, but I think it's a money making effort because if you go to so fast, you know, I call it more public health grift. We really just didn't need this portal. Okay. Each school should have their own portal. We should be able to make a unique application to each school. You know, I, I don't like this because I, you know, you should be able to showcase yourself differently to each school. This portal has a one-star rating. doesn't surprise me because every time I use it, it is awful to use. And by the way, just as a side note, those of you who, want, who have an MPH and want to get a certification, a CPH like I have, that's run by the CEPH2, and that has its own portal, which is also, it, it's gotten better over the years, but it's also crappy. So, um, so this leads up to like, what do, why do I know all this? And what am I talking about? What do I do? Well, what I do is I help people wherever they are in their learning journey in public health. Now, some of, some people are just into data science that I help. They're not really into public health, but if you're into public health or you're into data science and public health, even if you're a healthcare practitioner or whatever, if you're trying to do this public health thing, this public health education thing, I can help you. Okay because uh, it is very hard to do it um, because of the way these systems are set up. You know, there's a lot of corruption and fraud and these, um, you know, I, I can't say, oh, this person is a fraud or that person is corrupt. It's the systems are set up for corruption. Like the people who are running the APHA, the CEPH, all of that stuff, they all end up kind of being the same people. And people like me who have businesses, we tend to benefit. Like they they send their business to us, not to me personally. But that SOFAS um, uh, site, why is it so bad? Well, probably somebody was friends with somebody, you know, um, in that was involved. And and so that so this sort of group think that has kept out a lot of people like me, you know, who follow my demographic basically. And who are concerned about the issues I'm concerned about, like the ones I showed you on the early slide, we get shut out. And so we don't get to um, manipulate these systems and try to get some of that. So that's, so that's what I mean is the system becomes corrupt because it's biased. And and not, I, I wouldn't like po point to any individual person and say they're corrupt. I would just say the whole system is corrupt and people are not standing up and stopping it. That I would point to those people. People at the University of Minnesota, who these white people are still in charge, they're not standing up and stopping it. They're not standing up and saying, OK, it's time for some black woman who has been, uh, you know, not given credit for her studies of, you know, incarcerated women or of uh, maternal mortality or whatever. You know what? Well, it's time for you guys to to run this place, you know. So really, I I'm just indicting the system. Okay, I, and I'm indicting the people who just let it go, just let it happen. And they don't stand up and scream like I'm trying to do because I just will be kicked to the side. But you get to benefit because I have a business now. Like I can't work in these infrastructures because I'll just get vomited out. But with my business, you can hire me to help you, right? Like you can, as I mentioned, you can hire me to help you with your MPH application. And don't you think I'm going to give you the inside scoop on all of these 
you know, programs. I'm going to help you decide maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not like perfectly predictive. Like I'm not a perfect like psychic, but I can pretty much, you know, give you with a high probability what programs are better than others. And I, I can sh I'm evidence-based, right? I can show you like why I think some program might be crappy versus some other program or what program might be right for you. Like at the end of the day, among good programs, you might not fit in one because it's not right for you. Like you might not like Minnesota, right? So I help you. If you come to me for this, what's in the blue part of the slide, your MPH application, I help you with all of that. Okay. And I help you write your personal statement and all that. I and and like I said, you know, I guess maybe it's a bias because of me, but all my customers get into our MPH program. So I I I don't know who they reject. <laughs> so uh if you if anybody has gotten rejected from an MPH application, um please put in a comment anything about it because I'm you know, I'm sorry, first of all, and second of all, I'd be curious as to why. Then let's say you actually make it into an MPH program. And sometimes people deliberately go to a bad program because their workplace is paying or it's online, it's the only thing convenient, and they know it's going to be low quality, even though it's accredited. Well, then that's my business. I make a lot of money off of you. Um, I try not to make too much off of you, but what I'll, I'll do is I'll sit down and we'll look. Usually what I do is each time we you have a course, we decide, do you need my help with it or not? You know, if you're already a nurse and you have a course in cardiovascular disease, you probably don't need my help. But maybe you do because the skills you're taught in your MPH have more to do with research than like other things you may have done in medicine or in healthcare before. So I just take it on a case by case basis. We just see what kind of help you need and what I can give you. And I do everything over Skype. And what we do is we sort of create a like a Dropbox together and we share things. And I teach you how to use Zotero, the... Um, my citation program and and then you keep using it um i think like if you're if you're one of my customers you're watching this um and you've had the benefit of working with me you know just put a comment and say like what you learned that's been helpful like what you learned during your studies that still is helpful with your job because that's i i don't just teach you your mph i teach you the stuff that you're not learning in your mph because of all these issues I was surprised when I started my um, my business in 2012 that after people got their MPH or, or whatever degree I was helping them get, that they often contacted me after they got a job. So they'd be like working at a public health department or working at Big Pharma or working you know, at a health education place or something. And they'd be like, I don't know how to do my job. And what I realized, so what didn't they know how to do? I mean, they knew biostatistics, epidemiology and stuff, but they really didn't know how to apply these skills in a real-time environment. They didn't know leadership. They didn't, I have so much experience. Every time people come to me with a problem, I already have a whole bunch of choices of what you can do about it. So if you're, so if you're listening to this and you're at any place in this journey um, and you think I could help you, you know, just contact me on LinkedIn and I'll meet with you. Um, and give you like a free consultation. We'll just see, is there something I can help you with or maybe not? But in any case, in my free consultation, I can probably give you some advice like about, you know, programs, we can go look at stuff on the internet. And so, um, so yeah, so I'm all about MPHs. I mean, I think it's really, if you can get the, the do the studies and get the skills, I think this is some of the most valuable skills I've learned in my life and I use them all the time. And so it's worth it. But unfortunately the US makes it hard. I think it does a lot of things. So um, actually, you know, I haven't asked, seen if anybody is asking me. Nope, nobody's. Um, so again, uh, if you're joining or you join in the middle and you're um, trying to ask questions and you don't see any um, thing in the chat, it's because I don't know why my software's not working for that. But I, if you're on LinkedIn or even on YouTube and ask questions, I should be able to come back and answer them. All right, so in conclusion, how to join an MPH program? Well, first, you really want to do a lot of shopping. You want to choose the program you want, and you also want to choose the timing. Like, do you want to start next fall? If you want to start in fall 2022, you probably should be applying now. Um, if you want to start, and you usually can start in winter, you know, they're usually kind of flexible that way. So just start thinking about those things. 
and also um like if you want to go to the u.s or somewhere else and if you want to like i help people get their mphs other places but i'm kind of an expert at the u.s right because i'm from here um and so then the next step is you apply for through SOFAS if you're going applying to a uh, U.S. college, um, and that includes letters of recommendation, transcripts, personal statement, and I can help you get all that crap together. And it changes every year a little bit, not a lot, but I can help you with it. And then um, let's say that you obtain, you, you decide that you're going to apply or you get accepted, and it's time to go get your MPH. Um, no matter what kind of program you're in, whether it's one that you really wanted, it's really good, or one that's like you're kind of iffy about, you know, never, never hesitate to contact me if you think I can help. Like a lot of, even my customers will sometimes contact me like halfway through a class and be like, Monica, I really wanted to avoid you <laughs> for this class, but I, I'm suffering. I can't even, like one of my longtime customers who I just love she has her mph and she's getting uh like a mental health nursing degree and she's in this evidence-based nursing class and evidence-based nursing classes don't get me started they're so goofy they don't follow like epidemiology and so she's really confused and, uh, and she's like monica i didn't want to contact you i'm like just contact me if you if you're worried just contact me i don't know what i'll do okay i'll I'll, what I'll do is meet with you and I'll look at where you are in the class and I'll look at um, the syllabus and I'll look at, um, you know, your grade and what they're trying to teach you and see if I can help you. You know, I'll be honest with you in my business in my last 10 years, there have been times where like there was one time in an accredited online program one of my customers learners you know got an assignment and we worked through the assignment and it was doing epidemiologic calculations like prevalence incidence and stuff those of you know what i'm talking about and she got all the answers wrong and so i was like i made you get the answers wrong to these epidemiologic calculations that doesn't make sense well it turns out one of the other people in her school now remember this is online so they didn't really know each other but luckily she had had a group project, an online group project with somebody. And that person Googled the internet and found the exact same homework assignment with the answers in it, you know, that I guess this teacher had used. And the answers were the answers I had guided her to do. So she said to me, Monica, you didn't get anything wrong. It's our teacher doesn't know, doesn't understand how to do it right. So this is a great example of what the problem is with these accredited colleges is here. And, and I've seen this with another one like that, like another, they had a guest lecturer who gave some assignment and my learner, I, I, I formulated this complicated email explaining how the assignment to make sense, you know, like he was trying to get him to estimate a, a two year rate of something happening in a one year study in a study that ends after a year. So how do you get a two year rate? Like, that's the kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, epidemiology is really confusing and my field is really confusing and it's really hard to teach. And, you know, I, I would, you know, in fact, when I was going to the University of Minnesota, like my my friends from college will uh, attest to this, I complained profusely about, I was like, you know, I, I remember we had a, a lesson in case control studies and I was so confused about the difference between an exposure odds ratio and then, um, and a disease odds ratio. And I was just complaining about it. I don't, I don't think people graduating today even know the difference between exposure and disease odds ratio from a lot of these programs. I mean, how I, I'll help people through their PhD. Like one of my, one of my closest customers, I met him after he graduated with his PhD from Emory university, which is supposed to be really good. Like it's in Atlanta near the CDC. He still, doesn't know incidence prevalence you know, all these calculations i'm telling you, he still doesn't know the that vocabulary i have to reteach it to him each time and i'll tell you if you go to the university of minnesota school of public health they will drill that into you i, I and i can guarantee it the same professors are still there they will drill it into you. They will make you write it. They will make you interpret your, they will make you look at SAS output and they will make you pick out 
um, estimates and write sentences and they don't hit you with a ruler, but it feels like you're kind of in school and they're, you're being schooled. Hello. Thank you. Thank you to University of Minnesota School of Public Health for schooling me. And um, so I, I'll tell you, that's a good place. And But I live in Boston now. We have several uh, public health MPH programs around. Uh, you know, if you go to Harvard, you will meet a lot of people. But I wouldn't go to Harvard because I don't think you get skills from that program. I never saw anybody leave that. I see people leave the Brandeis program without skills, kind of like the Emory program. The only program I see people leave and they've got the skills is Boston University. So if you're going for skills and you're in the Boston area, I would say MPH at Boston University. And you will see my forever intern is doing exactly what I say. That's why she's my intern. She listens to me. All right. Well, we didn't get any questions today. Let me make sure. Um, and it's probably because it's, um, I'll undo the chat overlay. It's uh, Memorial Day weekend. And I thought, you know, maybe no to show up, whatever. But that's okay. Um, because uh, you can watch this later and learn about how to become um, a member of the MPH program at one of these accredited colleges. All right. And, and also, uh, like I said, you know, contact me on LinkedIn or if you have my email. And we'll, we can always set up a, a free consultation and I can figure out how to help you if you're on a public health journey somewhere along it. If you're stuck or you stop to take a rest or whatever and you need a little advice, just contact me. I'll tune you up. All right. Well, have a good weekend. Have a good Memorial Day weekend. And um, I'll talk to you next week.